Tomorrow night here, same time, same station, New York Times reporter David Margolik and some untold stories about the O.J. Simpson trial. 36 million people in America today have a major physical or mental impairment, as does my next guest. But you will never hear Tom Sullivan complain about that. He has written a new book on how parents can deal with kids with disabilities. It's called Special Parent, Special Child. Mr. Sullivan, a pleasure to have you with us in the house. Thank you. Okay, my great pleasure. Good to see you again. And thanks for bringing Nelson, who is your guide dog, right? He is. And, you know, the first time you and I met, we, we were on Bel Air Country Club. At the golf course, yes, sir. This guy, when he was a baby, I trained him to retrieve golf balls by pouring aftershave all over him. And then I'd go out and play at midnight, because what the hell did I care? I hit him. <laughs> and he'd go get him. It was a terrific deal. Yeah, you can make these dogs it's the old, all kinds. It's the old joke about the three blind guys that uh, Tony Randall told on the Letterman show. The other, Can't they play at midnight? <laughs> <laughs> it's our golf course. Yeah. You know. uh, and so Nelson's been with you now for 10 years, huh? Yeah, he's. I was so touched listening to you talk about your mom because this fellow's at a transition fairly mm -hmm. soon in terms of the work he does. And it's interesting. Uh, so much of our lives are about transition. I think that's probably you're one of the only things that's constant. You've been here so long, you're older than dirt. You, you've been out here forever. Look at this. You and I did radio back years ago. I know. We did the first show in New York. I mean, you, I'll tell you what, I'm, you look very good to me. Well, I'm, <laughs> boy, am I'm, I glad to hear that. Yeah, I, I if I look good to you, I look great to most <laughs> <laughs> you know? Let me ask you about this book you've written now, but, you know, Special Time, Special People. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've heard you talk about this, and you say it's more important than any book I've, I've, I've ever is. written. And I mean, you know, we all enjoyed if, uh, if, you, could, uh, if, you, could, uh, if you could see what I hear. Why is this one so important, Tom? Because this book came, you know, I thought I knew everything there was to know about disability, because I was one. I had one. And then I went back to Boston, and this is why listening to you tonight was so touching, to my mother's 80th birthday party. And it was a real Irish deal. Uh oh. We had, you know, the band and the Jamesons on the rocks, and it was a. What are you drinking? What do you got? <laughs> That's right. Who's your best friend? Uh, and tell a story. So, a couple of hours into the party, my mother and I sat down, and I said to her, Mom, you must be so proud of this night. And she said, Tom, Tommy, she said, Oh, with that Boston accent, oh, Tommy, oh, she Tommy. said, yeah. I'm proud of you. She said, I didn't know that you'd ever get to this point. And I said, What do you mean? And she said, Well, she said, when you're the parent of a blind child, you're never sure about where it's going to end up. And I said, Go, tell me about this. And for the first time, she did. She, and here are the things she said. She said, Tom, when you were born blind, she said, I wouldn't come to terms with it. I was in complete denial. Mm -hmm. She said, I'd take a flashlight and wave it in front of your eyes. And if you moved your head, I'd say to people, see, he can see. Right. Then I went to the ophthalmologist. And the doctor looked at you and said, Mrs. Sullivan, take him home and love him or put them in an institution. And then there was the question of sibling issues. I have two wonderful sisters, but my mother was worried about whether she could love us all equally. Then there was the question of how do we educate them? Can, at the time, we used the phrase mainstream. Should I put them in a mainstream school or in a special, or in a special school? school? Yeah. And then there's the question of peer groups. How's he going to do with his peer group? Will they relate to him? Can he be socially integrated? So I started to think about this. And when I realized that there were six million families with kids under 10 years old coping with the issue. And not just the kids who are coping with the issue, but the moms and dads. Far more the yeah. moms and dads, Tom. And we now have a concept in this country of inclusion, where we put these wonderful children in the least restrictive environment. And that has nothing to do with making it work. Tell the crowd how well you did in special school. <laughs> <laughs> what? Because I was a, thrown out 11 times? 11 times, times yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had a little problem. I, discipline came difficult yeah. for me. Yeah. I, uh, I think the worst thing I ever did in special school was that I, I uh, we had wonderful blind kids that I went to school with. And I found out from a friend of mine in New Hampshire that I could buy Christmas wreaths for a buck a wreath, but that I could sell them for three seventy-five a wreath. So I went to the principal of the school. I said, can I have these blind kids go door to door and sell the wreaths? He said, sure. Well, we did. I paid them each a quarter, and I was making a fortune. They made me give the money to poor children in India. It was, <laughs> it was a tough deal. So, yeah, I, but, so blind school was probably a mistake for me. But what happened, Tom? But now, how do parents who have kids who've got problems, whether they're blind, whether they're deaf, whether they have Down syndrome, whatever, 
How do you convince authorities in the schools, give these kids a chance? Mm -hmm. Put these kids in here. These are mainstream kids. They may not be able to see, they might not be able to hear, but they can function, they can learn, and they will grow. First of all, Tom, you have to be, your the parent has to be the case manager. The parent has to step up and say, I know my child better than anyone else, and I will make the system work for my child. So you have to be a great case manager. You have to trust your instincts. You have to say, you know, when I assess this teacher, or I assess this professional, or I assess this system, I've got a feel for it. I may not know all of the technical answers, but I sure as hell know my child. So the parent has to clearly be a case manager, and they clearly have to trust their instincts, and they have to form allies with gifted professionals. They have to form alliances that work. But mom has, or dad, mom and dad have got to be the case managers here. You know the problem, Tom? Parents lose their own identity in this process. In the book, in Special Parent, the family with cerebral palsy, a cerebral palsy child, Sean, the Allens, Lindy said to me one time, she said, Tom, you know, there is no Lindy anymore. There's just Sean's mother. And I have to find Lindy again. That's why the national rate of divorce with parents who have special needs kids is well over 70%. Because in the stress of the caregiving, the question of who survives and how do they survive, and who are they in that process? How do they relate? Where is the intimacy? Does, is it still there? Mm -hmm. Where is the interaction? Is it still there? All of those things become so arduous for the parent. For example, again, with a cerebral palsy child, it may take, Tom, it may take an hour and a half to get the child dressed. Just that task alone saps the energy of a special needs parent. So finding the intimacy they need to be joined in a marriage that works is very complicated. Let me break uh, here for a couple of moments. We are with uh, Tom Sullivan. The book is called Special Parent, Special Child. You know the phone number at 800-952-2788. Time is short. We'll do the best we can to get some of you on here right after a brief timeout.